So, welcome, welcome everyone. This is our second talk in this series as part of the subject introduction to bioinformatics. And today we have with us uh, Tyler Aliotto. Um, um, Tyler uh, comes from the CINAC, the center, the National Center for, for um, Genome Annotation. Uh, he studied biology in Stanford, um, late, uh, where we started to uh, study uh, genomic development of, uh, of the tracheal system of Drosophila. Uh, later, he moved to Kyoto, um, where um, uh, he um, uh, was there an assistant professor. Uh, after this, he, re he came back to, to, um, to California, this time to Berkeley, to start uh, a PhD in molecular biolog biology in other uh, receptors, in, in the genomics of other receptors. And after this, uh, he came to Barcelona. He joined the CRG group uh, uh, with uh, Roderick Guigo for a postdoc. And later, uh, now he's the lead of, uh, of a team in SINAC responsible for, for the assembly and annotation of, of genomes. So you have started to use data from databases, genomes. Uh, so Tyler actually is one of the persons that uh, assembles and annotates uh, these, these genomes in, in uh, and in fact, with his, with his team, they have assembled uh, many genomes, including vertebrates, invertebrates, um, fungi, um, well, plants. Plants, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah for instance, the olive uh, tree, mm -hmm. the, the, the um, lynx. The lynx. Yeah, so yep. tomato, right? Many of them. So, welcome, Tyler. All right. Is this on? Okay. So how many of you have uh, used a database like Ensemble? Raise your hands. Okay. Everyone. Okay. What about the UCSC genome browser? Not so much. Okay. We're European, so Ensemble. <laughs> All right. Um, so I wasn't sure of your background, so I just wanted to, to really quickly cover DNA. Everyone knows what DNA is, right? Okay. And you know the, the four nucleotides, right? From now on, they're just A, C, G, and T, okay? You don't have to name them. From now on, they're just letters, right? So anyway, um, the idea, okay, is to sequence the DNA of an organism, okay, and create a reference genome, okay? And what we want to do uh, before, we did it for one species at a time, right? The human genome, very important. Uh, model species like C. elegans or Drosophila or the mouse, these were very important. But now, we know how uh, useful a uh, reference sequence is for biology. It's like a basic resource, right, that everyone uses in biology, and especially for bioinformatics um, and genomics. And so what we want to do is now create reference genomes for every species on Earth, okay, systematically. Um, and generate, uh, you know, genome browsers like this, which are for the human, right, but for all the species. Um, we'll have to rethink, uh, you know, the multiple alignment track at the bottom. <laughs> we won't be able to compare just, you know, four species at a time. We have to think big. Um, so these are the, this is the, the overarching kind of umbrella project uh, for sequencing all life on Earth. It's called the Earth Biogenome Project. And it has a goal to sequence all eukaryotic species, um, presumably because prokaryotes are already being handled uh, easily by many groups in the world. Um, and they're easy and don't require a, a, a joint effort. Um, at the European level, uh, we belong to something called the European Reference Genome Atlas. And this is essentially a European node of the Earth Biogenome Project. And then at the more local level, we have the Catalan Biogenome Project to sequence all the species in Catalonia, okay? We're nowhere near sequence, done sequencing all the species, right? Uh, we're starting with dozens or hundreds or, right? Um, so far, you know, in the order of a thousand, right? 
and at the CNAG, really just just dozens at the moment. Okay. Um, so the basic process to sequence a genome is to extract the DNA from the cells. Okay, so you have to chemically extract it, and maybe uh, you've heard about how this is done with phenylchloroform or with kits. Um, you're in a bioinformatics program, fine, okay, but maybe you've had a little experience in the lab. You definitely need to know what they do in the lab to do bioinformatics. You have to know what they do in the lab. You have to know what they do on the, the DNA sequencers. So you have to know the molecular biology. If you don't have hands-on experience, it's okay. Theoretical knowledge is, is okay. <laughs> okay. But you have to get it out of the, the cells intact. And this is very important, uh, especially to get very long fragments intact. Um, then we sequence them. I'm going to talk about sequencing in the next couple slides. Um, and those sequences generate reads. Okay, we call it a read. So you have a fragment of DNA and you get a read of the bases and the order that they're in. Okay. Um, these are mostly correct, but depending on the sequencing technology, you can have errors. So it's the most likely sequence of bases. It's not necessarily the truth. Keep that in mind. <laughs> You're always dealing with imperfect data. Okay, and then we take these and now they're just strings in a computer, right? A series of letters in the computer. And using different types of algorithms, you can detect where they overlap, meaning they share the same sequence. Okay, if they share the same sequence, we can join them together. And you can create any number of uh, assembly graphs. It could be a De Bruyne graph, it could be an overlap graph, a string graph. We work with graphs all the time, okay? So detecting overlaps, creating graphs, simplifying them, okay, and determining the, the path through the graph, which is the most likely path, and then generating a consensus sequence. And then sometimes we use other technologies to kind of join those pieces. We still don't maybe have full chromosomes and sometimes you have to use other data to, to finish the puzzle. So the goal, basically what I said about uh, prokaryotes before is that we've already just about solved prokaryotic genome assembly uh, with the current technology that we have um, with long reads. Uh, we can generate graphs that really resemble the reality, right? We have a, let's say a big, uh, you know, five megabase bacterial chromosome and four plasmids, okay? This is a real case from some of our data. This is a Klebsiella pneumonia, causes disease. So using long read technology, we can assemble these, get high quality genomes, and basically you get the graph and you see the reality. We're coming a long way. Uh, you can't really see it here, but there's a consortium called the telomere to telomere consortium, and they've been uh, working on the human genome, and now we have a gapless human genome. This is the previous version with a few tangles left in the graph, and the idea is to get to that for every species, okay? Um, but that takes lots and lots of resources. It's getting easier and easier. Um, so before talking about assembling reads, we have to talk about the sequencing technology. Has everyone heard of Illumina? Okay, who has not heard of Illumina? No, I don't want to point any. Everyone's heard of Illumina, right? It's a, a big DNA uh, sequencing platform com company. Um, and so we've been, uh, so we started in the days of Sanger sequencing, okay? And so this is like throughput. Uh, this is how much sequence you get out of a machine, like raw sequence. And this is the length of the reads, basically the length of the fragments that are, that are read by the sequencer. 
And Sanger was you know, it was a very good technology. Okay, it's based on uh, synthesizing DNA and stopping it at random points with a certain nucleotide, and then you can run them on a gel and see and see the length of those fragments and determine the order of the bases. Okay, Illumina comes along first was, was Celexa, it was bought by Illumina, and the, it's a very similar idea using a DNA polymerase to synthesize DNA um, with labeled nucleotides. Um, but stopping it after every cycle. Um, that's on the next slide. Um, I think I'll just show it right there. Okay. Um, and this is great. And now we can get billions of reads in a span of just one or two days. Okay. Um, the newest machines are like, they give you 10 billion reads and you get about 300 bases. Per, per read, and usually this is 150 bases and 150 bases from either end of a DNA fragment. These are paired end reads. The, DNA, the, the, the sequence is really high quality. There's very few errors. Um, everyone in the world's using it. 90% of all DNA sequencing is done with Illumina, probably. The, the figures change from year to year. Okay, but it's only 150 bases. So this is a big problem when you have a, a puzzle like a genome to solve. Um, so we have other technologies that came, came along. Uh, PacBio sits about right here, and then they have a, you know, they're improved machines, and uh, you know, probably this year they're going to have something else <laughs> uh, coming out. Um, and it's a very similar technology in the sense that it There we go. Sorry, there's a delay between the. Um, it's also sequencing by synthesis. So it has a DNA polymerase. It's incorporating nucleotides uh, into a new DNA strand that's complementary to the, the template DNA. Okay, so this is similar to Sanger, similar to Illumina, except it's done one molecule at a time. So that's why they call it single molecule uh, sequencing. Um, it also has an optical readout, so it has fluorophores, so does Illumina, and so did Sanger, actually. Um, but it's single molecule scale, and you can generate really long sequences, okay? As long as the, the DNA fragment is, with the limitation of the fact that the, the laser light <laughs> that's used to excite the fluorophore can kill the enzyme over time. So there is a limit. There is a limit to the, the read length. Um, and then their, their best technology is using these smart bell adapters and you can create a rolling circle synthesis. It just goes around and around and around creating many copies from the same original fragment like this. Okay. And uh, so the sequencing uh, is not perfect, you have errors, but you can align uh, all of the, these subreads that come out and generate a really high quality consensus sequence. So these are like 99.9% .9 accurate sequences. Um, the other technology that came out <clears throat> just after the PacBio uh, technology is the Oxford nanopore, nanopore machines, and this is what we have at the CNAG at the moment. Maybe mid next year we'll get a pack bio machine. Um, and the concept is a little different. Okay, so it's not using a fluorophore, it's not synthesizing DNA. It's just running a single strand of DNA through a tiny little protein nanopore. These are pores that sit in membranes, normally in cells, uh, but they've engineered it and put it into an artificial membrane. Um, and hooked up the electronics so that they can record the current. Um, and so as the DNA goes through, it kind of blocks the current, but each base kind of blocks it differently, okay? And so they use machine learning, a type of machine learning that you learned about, I think, in the last lecture, right? Okay, to decode this signal 
and turn it into a sequence of bases. Okay? And so, you know, they started out with, you know, even more than 15% error. The, the first sequencers that we got had like 30% error. It was almost unusable, right? But now they've, they've improved the, the chemistry, the rate that it goes through, the pour. They keep optimizing it and the base calling algorithms, the machine learning algorithms. And now we have like error rates like 1 to 5%, something like that. They have a chemistry out there. It's called Q20. So Q20 would be like 1% error. No. Hold on. Yeah, with everything under 1%, right? Um, so what, what does it look like if you align these reads back to the genome? This is a shot from IGV. IGV is a, a browser. Who's used IGV? One, one person has used IGV, OK? Um, it's really good. Uh, everyone should uh, learn how to use IGV or something similar, OK, to browse your genomic data. Um, so what you can do is you can align reads with any kind of read mapper, OK? For Illumina reads, BWA, these reads maybe with Minimap 2. And you see the, the Illumina reads are really short. And then there's regions of the genome that you don't get any reads mapping. OK? And it could be that the, this part of the genome is repetitive, and so you don't have any unique mappings there. OK? Or it could be there's a bias, a GC bias or something, and Illumina doesn't sequence it very well because it has an amplification step. Um, the long reads uh, are aligned here. And keep in mind, this is a, a slide from PacBio. OK, so they used an old Oxford NAM4 chemistry here, showing lots of errors. Um, the current chemistry looks more and more like the hi-fi reads from PacBio. But here they show like very few errors and a very good consensus. And you can separate, uh, if it's a diploid organism, you can, you can see the one haplotype and another haplotype. Um, Anyone know what a haplotype is? You can think of it as like an allele of a gene, right? A maternal or paternal allele of a gene. Um, but haplotypes are, are, tend to be longer than just a gene. They include many genes. Uh, these are called haplotype blocks, OK? And then those, those blocks are kind of broken by recombination between generations, right? Um, so hi-fi reads are now being used uh, to sequence many, many genomes. Okay, they're incredibly useful and produce very high quality sequence because the error rate is so low. And it's even possible to sequence and assemble diploid uh, genome sequences. So maternal allele and paternal allele. And <coughs> nanopore sequencing is getting there. Okay, and it has the advantage that the, the reads can be even longer, OK? There's no limit to the length of reads. So there, you can get multi-megabase reads um, if you're very careful. <laughs> OK, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to like how we do the assembly, OK? Um, 20 minutes have gone by, and you haven't learned anything. <laughs> um, Again, this is idealized, so I'm just going to skip through this slide. Um, basically, we take all those reads, find the overlaps. OK, I'm going to move on. Um, call the consensus, and then we annotate um, the genome. So this is everything our team does. And we have assigned functional annotations to each of the gene models. OK, I'll get in the last part of the talk, I'll talk about genome annotation. Okay, it's, it's just as important as assembling the genome, except you have to have a genome assembly first. Okay, so actually what I went to do at the CNAG when I moved to the CNAG was to annotate genomes. 
okay? Because I came from Roderick Hugo's group. I worked on ENCODE, annotating the human genome, other genomes. And I went to the CNAG and said, well, you're gonna have genomes. You need them annotated. I'll do that. I sold myself, you know, to do genome annotation. But we didn't have anyone to assemble genomes. We had no genomes assembled, so we had to assemble the genomes before we could annotate them. So that's how I got into genome assembly. You'll find this in bioinformatics. You'll, either it's an unsolved problem or there's no one to do it, so you do it. You learn it and you do it, right? Um, so before moving on, I've talked about reads, okay? I thought maybe kind of a, some definitions here, and I'll make the presentation available afterwards so that you can, you don't have to copy everything down or anything, okay? So a read is like a, a sequence of base calls, okay? Um, a contig is basically the, the first step of genome assembly Right, like I said, is 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 finding overlaps, right? And and then simplifying a graph, and where you have an unambiguous path through the graph, you can merge all the the I would call them unitigs and form contigs, um, but you merge all the reads together, okay? And when you merge them you have a multiple alignment, and you can call a consensus sequence, okay? And this will get rid of random errors. Um, so a contig is a, a unambiguous, continuous sequence, right, with no gaps, no gap characters, no ends, no IUPAC codes for weird bases, okay? Just totally defined. Then a scaffold, is where you have, oops, sorry, where you use some other information, okay, to determine the order of those contigs in the genome, okay? So you can order and orient them, ideally into chromosomes, okay? And you'll get a sequence, uh, and if you put this into a FASTA file, you would have a contig, and then you'd have a series of ends to represent unknown bases and then maybe another contig, okay? We have other file formats which are a little bit better than that. Um, there's GFA, which maintains the graph structure. Um, we have other files like tiling path files and AGP files that keep track of what kind of gap, whether the size is known or it's unknown, kind of estimated size or not. But this is, this is simplified. This is, normally most biologists just end up working with a file with, that looks like that, okay? And then the last thing that I'll mention several times during the talk is a metric for um, describing the contiguity of a genome assembly, okay? It's called the N50. It's not a perfect metric, but it's better than some other ones, okay? so. If you have a set of sequences and you want to know, like, basically, what's the average length of the contigs in this assembly, you could average them, but you might have, like, a, oh, man, sorry. You might have, like, a bunch of, like, 10 base sequences at the end or something like this, you know, 100 base sequences, maybe the, the length of an Illumina read, and they're not really assembled. You, Generally, we, we keep the reads out and we keep only contigs, which is at least two reads, you know, assembled. But there could be a bunch of small stuff at the end. And if you just took the average, let's say there were a million one nucleotide sequences down here, the average would be like one. <laughs> okay. All right, so what we do is we use a metric called N50, and it's like a weighted median. So you can think of it as like half of the assembly Let's say if you line up all the, the contigs from largest to smallest, half of the assembly can be represented by contigs or scaffolds of this length or bigger. Okay, so the N50 of this set of, of five sequences is 7 kb. Okay? Where the average is probably different. I haven't calculated the average. 
So higher end 50 means better contiguity for the assembly. Um, so going in with the sequences, we want higher coverage because with higher coverage, you can get longer contigs. I'm going to show you why in just a second. Okay. We also need, well, longer reads definitely help. Okay. You might think that you could assemble a bunch of short reads. If the genome sequence were completely random, random gibberish, okay, with, with no just completely random evolution, you could do it. You could do it. You could use short reads, assemble a genome probably just fine, okay? Um, because the number of possibilities of let's say 150 base read, the, the number of possibilities is a lot higher than the number of uh, uh, short sequences in the genome. But that's not the case. There are repeats, okay? There are repetitive sequences in the, in the genome. And uh, you, can't, uh, you can't assemble past those without longer reads or with other information joining the two sides. And quality is important because if you have low quality, first of all, it's harder to find overlaps. Um, it's harder to know which overlaps are the correct and which ones are spurious. Um, and also, once you assemble the sequence and you, uh, you derive a consensus, uh, those, those errors can end up in the assembly. So it's good to have high quality reads as well. Um, so just with coverage, what do I mean by coverage? Does anyone know what I mean by coverage? If you can think of it as um, how many, so if you, you, let's say you have a genome that's, um, I don't know, one, one gigabase long, let's say. Um, coverage would be how many, how much sequence uh, do you produce in terms of that one gigabase. So if you have a one gigabase genome, like a bird or something like this, to get uh, 50x coverage, you would need 50 gigabases of sequence, okay? You generate 50 gigs of sequence that are good. Um, you could even, if you have a reference, align it back, and you'll see that your read depth is about 50 when you align it back. So every position is covered in the genome more or less 50 times, okay? It's not going to be exactly like that, but as your, your coverage goes up, you know, the length of your contigs will go up. And I'll demonstrate that with um, this kind of thought experiment, okay? There's this concept of balls and bins, okay? It's a statistical concept that has nothing to do with genome sequencing, per se, okay? It has to do with the probability of, of bins being filled or not. So imagine you have a thousand boxes, okay, and you're throwing balls like ping pong balls or tennis balls, paddle balls, whatever, into these boxes randomly. It's just you're shooting them randomly at the boxes. They'll start filling up, but some boxes will get more than one and some boxes will get none, right? It's a random distribution. Um, and so with 1x coverage, um, you throw 1,000 balls at the 1,000 bins, okay? Now, doing that, we still have 361 empty bins, okay? That's no good, right? So we do it again, and we throw another 1,000. So now we've thrown 2,000 balls, so this is 2x coverage. There's still 142 empty bins up here, right? This is a histogram. These are the empty bins here, right? And you keep going, you keep going, keep going. Now we're down to seven empty bins, three empty bins, two empty bins, one empty bin. Ah. So even at 8x coverage, we still have one empty bin. Okay. Fine. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, so you can think of genome sequencing the same way. 
So instead of bins, you have loci in the genome, locations in the genome. And instead of balls, you have reads, you know, fragments of DNA that you've sequenced. And with Sanger sequencing, which is about 1,000 nucleotides long, high quality, <laughs> people generally did 7 or 8x coverage of the genome, knowing that we'd still have some bins that are not covered, OK? But it was terribly expensive. Remember, the human genome costs like $3 billion. OK? Um, so everything, every, every sequence costs something, right? Um, now it's not the case. We can produce tons and tons of sequence, and it's pretty cheap. So we tend to go to much higher coverage now, like a 25x or 50x or 100x. It depends on the, the technology, but kind of over-sequencing the genome to make sure that we get a complete genome sequence, right? Um, read length, I just uh, mentioned, we have to, if this is a repeat graph in the genome, so these are unique segments, say A, C, D, and B, but then there's a shared segment in the graph that's a repeat. So this repeat occurs at least twice in the genome here. So maybe you have, maybe you have C, R, B, or you have C, R, D. We don't know, right? It's ambiguous. One way, you see the, these reads here, read two and read three, don't cover the repeat. Uh, you can detect overlaps there, and you might be tempted to say it's A, R, B, but you could have the same thing happen with read two and read four, and it's A, R, D, right? So it's still ambiguous, right? You can detect overlaps across the repeat, but if the, the reads aren't long enough, you can't tell which way it goes. Read one is a long read that goes all the way across, right? And it goes this way. It goes C, R, D. So now we can join C with D through the repeat R. And we can assume that we can join A and B through repeat R, right? Um, you can also use other information like mates or linked reads or um, uh, contacts between different parts of the genome to link one segment to another. Okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. And for every genome, there's kind of a read length that would resolve uh, the assembly. Um, for something simple like a bacteria like E. coli, that's about 7 kb. If all the reads were 7 kb, you could assemble the genome, it'd uh, go across all the ribosomal repeats, and you'd be fine. You get one circular assembly at the end. Uh, for the human genome, I don't know what it is. It's probably hundreds of KB, okay? Because we have some duplicated sequence, segmental duplications in the genome, which are terribly long, right? But with Oxford Nanopore, we can actually, we can actually sequence across some of these. And with the hi-fi reads, because they're so accurate, uh, even just a few variations in that sequence can help us resolve those segmental duplications. You know, they may be 99.9% .9 identical, but still with the technology that we have now, it's becoming possible. Um, but you need really long reads, and so it's like assembling a jigsaw puzzle. If you have really short reads, it can be quite difficult small pieces, you know, but the bigger your pieces are, the easier it is to assemble a puzzle, okay? It's like, uh, and the repeats are like the sky pieces, right? Blue sky or, you know, the, the grass or something like this, something really repetitive. Those are hard to put together, right? But if you add one piece that includes them all and then it connects some tree to some house or something like that, no problem. So it's very similar. Um, we're doing pretty well. I'm going to wrap up the assembly part here with some real, like, this is the, these are the programs we use. These are the pipelines we use, OK? Um, this is a schematic of a pipeline. This is, like, more true to what we do. 
this is kind of our general recipe. And uh, this figure is from a, like a review that we did in Catalan. <laughs> and we're trying to come up with the words for the different processes. So assembling uh, contigs, we use uh, uh, next de novo or fly. So we assemble the long reads first. OK? Assemblacha, we could call it assemblacha. I don't know. OK? Um, we put refinement. I don't know. This is, we call it polishing. In our group and around the world, it's called polishing. OK, we polish the sequence, meaning we try to correct any errors that have made it through the consensus calling done by Fly or Next de Novo. And we use other programs that align the long reads back to the genome, and we align short reads, like Illumina reads. So wherever we can align Illumina, we can get really good polished sequence with no errors. Um, regions of the genome that are very repetitive, uh, we can't really map the Illumina data to very well, and so we end up with some repeats with, with errors. Okay, but in the like in the coding parts of the genome, it's okay. It's okay. Um, this is not necessary with the HiFi reads. So people using uh, HiFi, the PacBio reads, they skip the polishing. It's already really good. Okay, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, after that, we eliminate any uh, other problems like. Um, like haplotypes that we've accidentally included in our haploid genome assembly, okay? Um, some people also uh, try to produce diploid assemblies, in which case you want to keep all the haplotypes, but you be able to separate them properly, okay? And then scaffolding them into chromosomes, and then outputting the, and curating the assembly. So the, the kind of two ways of going about it are assembling and correcting, like I just said. So um, Fly, for example, uh, assembles and, and gets a graph that's quite tangled because it still has repeats. Okay, repeats cause little knots in the assembly graph. This is produced by a program called Bandage. So Bandage can take these assembly graphs in GFA format and, uh, and plot them. And basically, uh, Fly then does some repeat resolving steps, okay? Often using coverage along the, along the, along the, along the edges and is able to resolve the repeats, okay? Um, a lot of assembly algorithms do this and then you get a, more detangled. Um, ooh. Ah, there we go. Um, so like I said, you have to polish uh, the sequence afterwards, especially when using Illumina. Uh, Oxford Nanopore. <laughs> OK. Um, and we can usually use uh, the Nanopore reads themselves using another program. Uh, this will fix some of the errors. But then, like, there's. Oxford Nanopore doesn't get homopolymers very well, so sequences with like A, 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 doesn't know exactly how many A's there are. It may be off by one, okay? And uh, uh, those things don't get polished very well using the, the Nanopore reads themselves, but they can get fixed with Illumina, right? So if you align the Illumina reads, <clears throat> To the assembly, you can say, oh, we need to fix this one here, and we need to fix this one here, for example. Um, and maybe this, this indel here. Um, and then the other approach is to correct the reads first and then assemble them. Okay? And this is the approach taken by Canu and also HiFiism. And so what you do is you start with a bunch of reads. And you take these long reads and use them as seeds and align the shorter reads to them and then call a consensus and then you have basically a corrected long, long read. Okay. 
And then you assemble these um, with your assembly algorithm. Um, also, a similar process is taken by a hybrid assembler, Mazurka. And the most popular genome assembler right now out there is HiFiism, HiFi assembly, right? Um, this is written by uh, Hang Lee's group. So Hang Lee is one of these bioinformatics like gurus out there. He, uh, his group uh, works on BWA, which is a short read aligner, Minimap2, a long read aligner, uh, assembly algorithms like mini ASM, so like ONT reads, um, high fiism in this case. And everyone is using this now, if you have high fi data, <laughs> which we don't yet. Um, and basically, it does a, uh, this correction step, but it does it more intelligently than some of the other pre assembly correctors. It, it does a haplotype aware correction. So right now it works really well for diploid genomes. And I would say most of the genomes that there are out there are, are diploid. Um, when you get into plants, you have some polyploid genomes. Um, and there are some animals that are tetraploid and some other weird cases. Um, we don't have a problem with haploid genomes. We love haploid genomes, okay? <laughs> haploid genomes don't have the, if you know it's haploid, you know that there's no alleles. So every, everything you're correcting is an error, right? But anyway, uh, HIFISM does a haploid aware correction and then assembles the reads. And uh, this is working out really, really well. And the HIFI reads make this possible. Um, and then there's still issues with the extra haplotigs, we call them, okay? So artificial duplications of, of parts of the genome that uh, maybe appear as a repeat to the assembler, so it includes it in the genome, but it's really just the other allele of a locus, the other haplotype, and it's retained, okay? And if you have a, a haploid assembly, you need to get rid of it and everyone's using purge dupes. And again, the, the, the algorithms actually used are over and over using the same things, right? Uh, calculating uh, coverage. So aligning reads to the genome, calculating at every base what the coverage is, right? And getting the average coverage for a contig. Um, and it's doing alignments. It's aligning all the contigs to each other to see if any of them overlap, okay? Uses this, these two bits of information to then filter out any artificial duplications, and it makes some additional joins, okay? And then we have kind of a cleaned up assembly. It's been polished, corrected, uh, artificial duplications removed, and then you can use other information uh, to put it into chromosomes. So in the past, and still in agriculture and aquaculture and things, we have genetic maps where people have crossed um, parents and looked at the children and looked at the markers and how they segregate, and they can determine, um, they take advantage of recombination to determine the, the order of markers in things called linkage groups. They can be linked together, and these linkage groups basically represent chromosomes. And you can actually map these markers into your genome assembly and then use that to order and orient all the, the contigs, okay? Um, you need pretty high density uh, uh, maps uh, to do this, but um, so in some industries, uh, this is uh, standard, right? Uh, but for the vast majority of genomes out there, we don't have that information, so we use we have to use some other information. And um, it's it's funny, but we are now using something called HiC. So HiC is this chromatin confirmation capture protocol, okay? That's been adapted to Illumina sequencing, so we can do it at, at scale. 
And people are using it, uh, like in the CRG and, and CNAG, uh, Mark Marti's group. They use it to determine the 3D structure of DNA in the nucleus. Um, but some, some bioinformaticians a while back, like Jay Schenger, they, they realized that most of the contacts between pieces of, of DNA in the nucleus are very local and usually from the same chromosome. Okay, so they're intra-chromosomal contacts. And so we can use that information to actually order and orient uh, contigs into chromosomes. So now it's our main source of scaffolding information for genome assemblies. Um, and you get something that looks kind of like this. Uh, it's a contact map, kind of like a heat map, and so you have each one of these boxes is basically a chromosome. Okay. Um, I can show you another one. It looks like this. Okay. So you can use many different types of visualization software. Um, and you get uh, more contacts along the diagonal. So this is your plotting uh, in one direction the whole genome, uh, and the coordinates in this direction, and in this direction. Okay. And every point in the graph shows a contact between two pieces of DNA in the nucleus. Most of the contacts are intrachromosomal. And actually in this, maybe it's because of the contrast, you don't see any contacts between chromosomes. <laughs> okay. In real data, uh, on the screen here, you can see it's really pink in the background. So the, there are a lot of contacts here, but most of them are intrachromosomal. And so we use that to scaffold the genomes. Um, so that's just the summary again. How am I doing? Got 10 minutes left? Uh, no. OK. So this is what we're aiming for for uh, these big projects. So we want uh, Contig N50s to be over a megabase chromosome scale scaffolds, no more than one in uh, 10,000 bases is an error, plus all of these other metrics here. And we use a few programs that we run on our assemblies to evaluate all these things, okay? And this is built into our assembly pipeline, so that every step we're checking the statistics of the, the assemblies. Um, we're going to skip that. Uh, you can see that uh, some of the latest assemblies we've done, this is just a smattering of assemblies, have uh, much higher contiguity, and that's because we're using uh, the long reads, okay, and the, the high C info. I'll skip over the problems. I've discussed the problems, and really quick, two minutes on genome annotation, and then I'll take some questions, okay? I knew I would run over. Um, and in fact, you can, you can go and this should be available online by now. It's a 2009 uh, review that I wrote with Roderick and some other people talking about genome annotation. But this is, you want to find where the functional parts of the genome are. Uh, we usually start with the protein coding genes, okay? And, uh, to find them and to find where they are in, in the sequence, we need to find all the exons, okay, the coding exons and where the introns are. And so we can use statistical information about splice sites and branch voids and stuff like that, basically like uh, positional weight matrices. You'll probably learn about these. Um, coding potential, which is, is kind of counting more or less hexanucleotide frequency in the genome in very fancy ways, <laughs> okay? Or aligning sequences to the genome, right? So now we just, we sequence cDNA, right? And you can actually use long read sequencing to sequence cDNAs, okay? This is the easiest way to do it, okay? And aligning protein sequences, uh, aligning to other genomes and looking for conservation, and integrating all the information here into a, a combined consensus gene model. And then if you're, you're really um, particular, uh, doing manual annotation. 
Um, and we put all that into a pipeline with a bunch of programs. You can look at it later. Um, I worked on uh, this program here, GeneID. Okay, it's an ab initio gene predictor, um, meaning you can run it on a genome without any external information, just the genome sequence and run the program. It does have to be trained. Okay, so that does require evidence at some point, but it could be on a different genome to train the models. So now, if you want to run it on any vertebrate, that's fine. Right? Um, and that's just, uh, you, can, you can see it in finer detail. And we did some benchmarking of the, the annotation against uh, Maker. We need to do it again against the new, it's constant work. <laughs> Tweaking the pipeline, checking against Maker, Breaker, Breaker 2, all these pipelines. So there's a lot of pipelines out there. Um, we have some of our code here um, in our GitHub. Um, more information on the, the team website. And uh, I think it's time for questions. Well, thank or else you. you won't get credit for asking questions, I'm, I've been told. Yeah, that's right. So, so thank you very much for this interesting talk. So yeah, there is time for some questions. So we will start with people in the priority list. So you've talked about different uh, technologies that um, help us read uh, genomes, like Illumina, hi Read. Read. Yeah. Uh, what would be your technology of choice and why? Ah, well. Um, <laughs> Currently, it would be the Hi-Fi reads. Um, at the CNAG, though, we don't have a PacBio machine yet. It's, uh, we're acquiring it slowly. <laughs> um, it, the reason for that is, uh, yeah, the, the quality is really high. Uh, the algorithms have been designed around it uh, very well. It does have some limitations. Uh, you can only get hi-fi reads that are about 15 to 20 KB, and that's it. Okay, so for, for, other, for parts of the genome where you need longer reads, we have to go to Oxford Nanopore, right? So ideally, a combination of the two. I would want uh, hi-fi reads and Oxford Nanopore together. Yeah. Um. Hey, <laughs> my name is Stephanie, and yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, I really love what are you doing and all these projects, and I would like actually like do something uh, dedicated to genetics. Yeah. Um, what would be like the best way, like things to study and like be prepared to get like to that point? Like do a master's in genetics and huh. I, like, I don't know, it's just <laughs> to be curious. Yeah, I, uh, masters is a is a good plan um, for bioinformatics. Uh, we have lots of masters students that then. Um, so right now in my group, I have two technicians. Okay, I'm hiring another one. One has a PhD and one has a masters. Um, for the work we're doing, a masters is sufficient. Uh, but if you really want to do research, okay, if you really want to do I don't know, evolutionary biology, uh, maybe a PhD is the best, the best route if you want to end up in a research career. You know, because when you do a PhD, you learn not just techniques and when to apply them, you really have to think critically, uh, uh, come up with hypotheses, design experiments, you know, and you can do that in bioinformatics, but it's, it's not necessary, so it depends, depends. Yeah, depends on how much you want to invest time-wise. I think that error-free uh, reads will be available in the near future. Error-free. Um, no, I just think uh, the error rate will be very low. Yeah. It's, it's dropping. Uh, Oxford Nanopore keeps uh, improving. Uh, they have a duplex. Technology, it gives a Q30, which is one error in, I don't know, one error in a thousand, something like this. But it's not error free. It's not error free. 
a lot of these errors can be solved in the consensus step. So the, the good thing with uh, PacBio is that the errors are almost completely random. Almost. So in the consensus calling, uh, that's why you get very high consensus quality. Yeah, but it's not not error free. Yeah. Um, does knowing or living algorithm sequence have any application in the future? Does knowing living organism sequences? Ah, it, do you think it's yeah. useful? No, I what ask is I ask if it's useful or you do it just to know the sequence. OK, so there's a, a just to know it, right? Um, it could be that uh, some genomes that we sequence uh, never get looked at, you know, sure, right? Um, the, at some point, all of them will be. The, there's many groups that do comparative genomics. Uh, they have to work on algorithms to be able to compare all genomes, right? Uh, so I think in terms of evolutionary biology, uh, definitely uh, it's useful. Um, practically speaking, you never know which genome is going to have some hidden treasure, right? Um, the idea is if we do it systematically, we can save a lot of money in the long run. Because up till now, it's been one group does it, another group does it. Sometimes they do the same genome. Uh, there's a lot of redundancy at the moment. And if we do it systematically and we do it like a production line at scale, we can do it cheaper and faster. Um, it's like having an encyclopedia or Wikipedia, right? Maybe you don't read all the articles, but it's nice to know that they're there, <laughs> right? It's, uh, the information is being collected in one place, and you can go there and you can find it, right? Like libraries, we should collect all books, right, and keep them. Uh, do you think that bioinformatics could be useful to improve the knowledge um, related to the genome? And also, do you think that in the near yes. future we will be able to know to sequence all the genomes of the species? Yeah, uh, the goal of the Earth by the second question first. Um, the goal of the Earth Biogenome Project was to do this in 10 years, but that's not going to happen. But we're going to make a lot of progress in the next 10 years, right? Um, there, there will be some species that we just can't sequence, either because we can't get a sample. Uh, the, there's, you know, they could have some chemical in their cells that just makes it really difficult. Um, there's going to be a lot of genomes that we don't get to, OK? So the goal is all of them, uh, but the goal is to try all of them, at least. Um, and the first part of the question was? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the only way, <laughs> is through bioinformatics. Because uh, you see a sequence, you can't do anything with just the sequence. You need bioinformatics to add, and it, to, to add information. Adding information is annotating. So right, so it's not just protein coding genes. There's non coding genes. There's regulatory elements. Um, there's the, 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 even the structure of the DNA, right? Uh, nucleosome positioning. There are many, many areas that bioinformatics can help us understand uh, the genome sequences. Yeah. Um, talking about the Oxford Nanoport, we you started said two minutes late. So it's <laughs> you said that mm, before you have like a fifteen percent error. How could you work with a big? A high percentage like that? I, it was difficult to work with that. Um, but um, things have improved now, right? But because of the error rates, and even PacBio has 10, 15% error before they do the consensus, right? You have to have uh, 
algorithms that match very quickly and find overlaps very quickly. Okay? So sometime in your bioinformatics career, in your, in your studying, you're going to learn about alignment algorithms okay? and mapping. Mapping is fast alignments. Okay? Um, so you learn, I don't know, Needleman-Wunsch alignments, uh, maybe some Smith-Waterman. Uh, you learn some dynamic programming and be able to do this yourself with a few toy examples on your laptop. And then you'll learn other algorithms, like, you know, BLAST is, you know, somewhat accelerated, right? Um, BWA, you'll learn uh, uh, about suffix arrays. You'll learn uh, lots of different uh, uh, ways of aligning sequence. So sequence alignment is, like, fundamental in biology, even if you never code anything. Okay. But I recommend everyone just in your favorite program, program, programming language, Implement uh, needle, the needle program, needleman lunch. This is, you know. They will do it next year. They will have yeah. to do it next year. And for <laughs> Oxford Nano 4 and PacBio, there's uh, the minimizers. So it's a Kamer based uh, way of um, matching sequences. So, should, should we allow yeah. one final question? What do you think? Okay, uh, I would like to ask, how does the genomic sequence study affect other fields in science like medicine or biomedicine? In medicine? Like first personalized like, medicine? How does it help, more or less? Okay, well, the human genome sequence. Um, so, for example, uh, knowing the human genome sequence correctly is very important for things like cancer and rare diseases. Um, the problem with the reference at the moment um, is that it's from a mixture of individuals and mostly Caucasians, right? So there is a movement right now to get a more representative pan genome for the human, human genome. So to have as wide a breadth as possible and to do it uh, diploid assemblies, <laughs> okay? Meaning having the maternal and paternal chromosomes of like 500 individuals that uh, better represent the global population. Okay, and this is, will be a much better reference, okay, and they have to work out ways of representing that, maybe in a genome graph or something, a pan genome graph, and this will be a much better reference for um, personalized medicine, for example, right? Okay, thank you, thank you very much for, for your talk and for All accepting right. some of my questions. <laughs> Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Okay.